So welcome back everybody to our um, evening session uh, featuring Turner Nevitt of uh, the University of San Diego talking to, talking to us uh, about Thomas again, but perhaps from a somewhat different perspective, Thomas on the Eucharist from the equal questions, correct? Thank you. So welcome Turner, pleased to have you. Everybody is attentively watching. Uh, please start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Klima, for having mm -hmm. me, and thank all of you for your attention. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Uh, I'll begin. The body of Christ is the focus of a range of questions posed to St. Thomas Aquinas by the audiences at the quote, libidal disputations over which he presided as a master of theology at the University of Paris. Most of these questions are metaphysical in nature and arise from reflection upon the Catholic faith. According to that faith, the same body of Christ that was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, suffered, died on the cross and was buried, rose from the dead, appeared alive again to the disciples, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That very same body of Christ is now given to us as spiritual food under the appearances of bread in the sacrament of the altar, the Eucharist. In response to questions about the Eucharist itself, Aquinas attempts to explain how it could be that Christ's whole body comes to be really present under the appearances of bread. His answer is famous and familiar. By a unique and miraculous change called transubstantiation, the substance of bread is changed into the substance of Christ's body while the accidents of bread remain there without a subject. But why must this be the answer? Why can't Christ's body come to be present with the bread, for instance? When asked whether the bread and the body of Christ are both there together even for an instant, Aquinas insists that they are not. But in response to another question, he attempts to explain how a glorified body such as Christ's can be together with another body in the exact same place at least by God's power. So why can't something similar occur in the Eucharist? Again, why can't Christ simply assume the bread and thereby make it into his body? After all, in response to another question, Aquinas says that Christ had a non-human body during the three days he was dead. Yet he insists that it was the same body that was nailed to the cross merely because it had the same subject, Christ the word. So why can't something similar occur in the Eucharist? In this paper, I would like to investigate the reasons that Aquinas only offers his audiences the theory of transubstantiation to explain how Christ's body can come to be really present in the sacrament of the altar. Examining the full range of questions posed to him about the body of Christ reveals a number of relevant philosophical principles about, for example, God's power, the nature of substances and accidents, time, change, the identity of bodies over time, and the way bodies move and occupy places. And the questions about the Eucharist itself reveal a number of other theological principles about the power of the sacraments and their limits. Together, I think these principles uh, imply that nothing less than the complete transubstantiation of bread into the body of Christ is possible if Christ's body is to become really present in the Eucharist. So first, Christ's Eucharistic body. Aquinas took up five questions about the Eucharist itself in the course of his quod libido disputations. Three of these questions were posed to him during his earlier teaching period in Paris, and two of them during his later teaching period in Paris. The first of these two later questions barely touches on metaphysics. It asks, did Christ show us a greater sign of his love by giving us his body as food or by suffering for us? In his answer, Aquinas makes clear that he thinks the Eucharist is indeed spiritual food given to us out of love and a memorial and representation of Christ's suffering for us. But because that suffering involved the greatest loss to Christ, namely the loss of his life, whereas giving us his body as food involves no loss to him at all, Aquinas concludes that Christ's suffering for us was the greater sign of his love. This brief answer does at least show that Aquinas thinks the presence of Christ's body in the Eucharist and its subsequent consumption as food involves no loss whatsoever to Christ's body. 
the second of the two questions from Aquinas's later teaching period is squarely metaphysical. It asks, is the form of bread annihilated in the sacrament of the Eucharist? In his answer, Aquinas explains that annihilation is the change of something into nothing, ad nihil, and hence the form of bread is not annihilated in the Eucharist since consecration turns the bread not into nothing, but into the body of Christ. Thus, the consecration is not an annihilation, but a transubstantiation of bread into Christ's body. Aquinas insists that this is the only way for Christ's body to become present in the sacrament, since it cannot become present by changing place, he says, otherwise it would cease to be in heaven. In reply to the first objection, Aquinas makes clear that he thinks transubstantiation involves the whole bread turning into the whole of Christ's body, just as it is. He then draws a curious corollary. He says, if there had been a consecration during the three days Christ was dead, his soul would not have become present in the Eucharist, but only his unensouled body, just as it lay in the tomb. This answer suggests that transubstantiation and locomotion are the only two ways Aquinas thinks Christ's body could become present in the Eucharist. It also shows why he rules out locomotion. Christ's body must remain in heaven. Now Aquinas' reasoning here is based on the theological assumption that Christ's body is now in heaven, but also on the philosophical assumption that a body cannot be in two places at once. Aquinas defends the latter assumption in response to two other questions posed to him during his later teaching period in Paris. The first asks, can God make matter exist without form? And the second asks, can God make the same body to be located in two places at once? In response to the first question, Aquinas argues that God is existence itself and can therefore make anything to exist that is able to exist. Yet things that involve or imply a contradiction are not able to exist, and hence God cannot make them to exist. In response to the second question, Aquinas argues that it would be contradictory for a body to be located in two places at once, since a body is located in a place by having its dimensions surrounded by that place, leaving no part of itself outside the place. Hence, a body cannot be located in two places at once, and thus not even God can make a body do so. Aquinas has more to say about how a body is located in a place in the first question about the Eucharist posed to him during his earlier teaching period in Paris. It asks, is the whole quantity of Christ's body contained under the outward appearances of bread? Aquinas replies that without a doubt, Christ's whole body is present there. To explain how that can be, he distinguishes between two ways that things come to be present in the sacrament of the altar, by virtue of the sacrament's power or by natural concomitance. When bread is turned into Christ's body, his body comes to be present by virtue of the sacrament's power, but his blood only becomes present by natural concomitance, since his body does not exist without his blood. The opposite occurs when wine is turned into Christ's blood. His blood comes to be present by virtue of the sacrament's power, but his body only comes to be present by natural concomitance. Moreover, Christ's soul and divinity only ever come to be present in the sacrament by natural concomitance, since bread and wine are not turned into Christ's soul or divinity, but into his body and blood. Nevertheless, since his soul is inseparably united to his body, and since his divinity is inseparably united to his humanity, his soul and divinity both come to be present with his body and blood, but by natural concomitance. Aquinas then applies this distinction to the body of Christ and its dimensions. Christ's body comes to be present by the sacrament's power, he says, but its dimensions only come to be present by natural concomitance. Aquinas thinks this implies that Christ's body is directly related to the remaining dimensions of the bread, while his body's own dimensions are only related to the bread's dimensions indirectly. Yet things are just the opposite when a body is located in a place. The body's dimensions are directly related to the place, while its substance is only related to the place indirectly by means of its dimensions. Aquinas says that is why a body's dimensions have to be commensurate with the place that it is in, and also why the dimensions of Christ's body do not have to be commensurate with the bread's dimensions or with the place they are in. 
He thinks that's how Christ's whole body can be present under dimensions of bread as small as you like. Since his body's dimensions only relate to the bread's dimensions and to its place indirectly. The second question posed to Aquinas during his earlier teaching period asks whether the substance of bread and of Christ's body are ever present at the same instant under the bread's outward appearances. As I mentioned already, Aquinas insists that the bread and the body of Christ are never there together, even for an instant. But his account of why they are not has nothing to do with the impossibility of two bodies being in the exact same place. It all turns on the nature of transubstantiation. The last question posed to Aquinas about the Eucharist during his earlier teaching period in Paris is the one whose answer is now so famous and familiar. It asks, do the outward appearances under which Christ is contained in the sacrament of the altar exist there without a subject? Aquinas replies that without a doubt, those accidents exist there without a subject. To explain how that can be, he points out that God is the first cause of all things, and thus brings about created effects more powerfully than their secondary causes. Accidents usually come forth from God by means of the substance on which they depend, but as the first cause, God can maintain accidents in existence directly without their substance. That is how Aquinas thinks the appearances of bread remain in existence without a subject in the Eucharist. The bread is turned into the body of Christ, while its appearances are kept in existence by God alone. In this connection, Aquinas clarifies the true definition of substances and accidents. A substance is commonly defined as something that exists in and of itself, and an accident as something that exists in and of something else. Yet if that were the true definition of an accident, then not even God could make an accident exist without a subject, since that would imply a contradiction. What exists in something else would not exist in something else. Instead, Aquinas argues that the true definition of an accident is something whose nature is owed existence in something else. And a substance is something whose nature is owed existence, not in something else. And of course, an accident's nature can continue to be owed existence in something else, even if it does not, in fact, have existence in something else. Thus, no contradiction is involved in accidents existing without a subject and hence they can be made to do so, at least by God. Okay, now Christ's glorified body. Given that Aquinas thinks God's power extends to anything that does not involve or imply a contradiction, it might appear curious that he only offers transubstantiation to explain how Christ's body can come to be present in the Eucharist. Can that really be the only possible explanation? Why can't the body of Christ come to be present with the bread, for instance? As I mentioned, Aquinas thinks Christ's body comes to be present just as it is by the sacrament's power. But Christ's body is now glorified. And Aquinas thinks that a glorified body can be together with another body in the exact same place, at least by God's power. He explains his reasons for thinking so in reply to two questions posed to him during his second teaching period in Paris. The first asks, is it naturally possible for a glorified body to be with another body in the exact same place? The second asks, could that happen miraculously? In reply to the first question, Aquinas says that it is not naturally possible for two bodies to be in the exact same place, since bodies are in a place by virtue of their dimensions, which are distinguished by virtue of their distinct positions. Indeed, Aquinas defines dimensional quantity as quantity with a position. Hence, different bodies occupy different places because they have different dimensions with different positions in and of themselves. That is why putting a wooden cube in water or air displaces that much water or air, he says. But in reply to the second question, Aquinas says that God can make two bodies occupy the same place. Usually bodily matter is distinguished by its dimensions, which are distinguished by their position. But as the first cause, God can keep effects in existence without their usual secondary causes. Hence, just as God keeps accidents in existence without a subject in the Eucharist, God can keep bodily matter and its dimensions distinct without having a different position, Aquinas says. 
That is how he thinks it is possible for two bodies to be in the exact same place. In fact, he thinks that that actually happened when the risen Christ came into his disciples behind closed doors. As he passed through the doors, Christ's glorified body was miraculously in the same place as the doors. So Aquinas would seem to have no objection to Christ's glorified body being together with bread in the same place. Yet Aquinas still thinks that that cannot be how Christ's body comes to be present in the Eucharist. Why not? Well, as I mentioned, Aquinas thinks that Christ's body must remain in heaven. But more importantly, he thinks that a body cannot be in more than one place at a time, not even by God's power. So he thinks two bodies can be in the same place by God's power, but one body cannot be in two places by God's power. And he reiterates his reasons for thinking so in reply to the question about two bodies being in the same place. He explains that one body being in two places entails a contradiction because a place is by nature the boundary of the thing located in it. And the thing's boundary marks the area outside of which no part of the thing is located. Hence, if a body were in two places, it would be outside the place it is in and would thus both be and yet not be located there, which is impossible. Yet this is no problem for the Eucharist, Aquinas adds, since Christ's body is present there by transubstantiation. But it would be a problem for the Eucharist if Christ's body were present there by being located there with the bread, since the Eucharist is offered on different altars at the same time and reserved in different tabernacles at the same time all over the world. Thus, being present with the bread would require Christ's body to be in more than one place at a time, which Aquinas considers impossible. There's the further problem of how Christ's body would get there if it came to be present with the bread. For Aquinas thinks that a body cannot change places without passing through the space in between. He makes this clear in reply to a question about the movement of angels from his later teaching period in Paris. It asks, can an angel move from place to place without passing through the space in between? In reply, Aquinas says that this is possible for an angel, but not for a body. For a body is in a place by being contained by the place, and hence its motion must follow the conditions of place, meaning that it has to pass through one place in order to reach another, just as one place connects to another through the space in between. Presumably that is why Aquinas thought the risen Christ came into his disciples behind closed doors by passing through the doors. His glorified body could not just suddenly appear there out of nowhere. So if Christ's body came to be present with the bread on the altar, we should be able to see it passing through the surrounding air as it gets there. Yet that is not what we observe in the Eucharist. This problem might be solved by the fact that Aquinas thinks glorified bodies no longer have any need of a place to contain them. This is why he says in answer to another question from his later teaching period, that a glorified body can be on top of the outermost Empyrean heaven, where it would have nothing surrounding it to serve as its place. If a glorified body has no need of a place to contain it, then it's not clear why its motion from place to place would need to follow the conditions of place and thus pass through the space in between. So perhaps Aquinas could allow for Christ's body to suddenly come to be with the bread on the altar. Nevertheless, Aquinas clearly thinks uh, that if a body is to be in a place, it must be in a place. We have a transmission time. problem. We have a problem. Mm. It may not be here. But, um, yes, it's coming back. Sorry, we had a transmission problem. Okay. Can you hear me? Froze. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Maybe I'll just go back a little bit. Yes. Um, you were in the middle of the sentence saying that uh, um, a glorified body, 
does not need to move according to the conditions of um, the space and the location. Right. So it could, in principle, appear out of nowhere. Right, right. That's right. But nevertheless, Aquinas clearly thinks that if a body is to be in a place, it has to be in a place commensurate with its own dimensions, since being in a place just means having its dimensions contained by that place. So even if Christ's body could just suddenly come to be present with the bread on the altar, once it got there, it would still have to occupy much of the air surrounding the bread on the altar, since Christ's body is much bigger than a piece of bread. So again, we should be able to see Christ's body with the bread on the altar, if it came to be present there with the bread. Yet that is not what we observe in the Eucharist. Okay, now Christ's non-human body. Although Aquinas seems to believe that transubstantiation and locomotion are the only ways that Christ's body might come to be present in the Eucharist, there is a third way worth considering, namely assumption. Why can't Christ simply assume the bread on the altar and thereby make it his body? It might seem inappropriate for God to have a non-rational nature, but that is, in fact, what Aquinas thinks happened during the three days Christ's dead body lay in the tomb. Aquinas explains his thinking on this matter in response to three questions from his later teaching period in Paris. The earliest of these questions asks, was Christ numerically the same human being during the three days he was dead? In reply, Aquinas explains that since his body and soul were no longer united so as to constitute a human nature, during the three days he was dead, Christ was not a human being at all, and hence he was neither the same human being nor a different one. Nevertheless, Christ was still the same person, Aquinas says, and he remained united to the same separated soul and to the same dead body in the tomb. Yet was the body in the tomb numerically the same? Aquinas says that it was the same in matter, but not in form, since the soul is the body's form and was separated from it at death. Hence, Christ's body cannot be said to have been absolutely numerically the same in the tomb. Instead, it underwent a substantial change, which keeps a thing from being absolutely the same. In other words, it was not even a human body anymore. It was a corpse. Aquinas makes the same point in reply to another question on this matter from his later teaching period in Paris. It asks, after his death, was Christ's eye called an eye equivocally? In reply, Aquinas explains that because the soul is united to the body as its form, the separation of the soul makes for a substantial change to the body and to its parts. Its specific addition its specific definition no longer applies to it, and hence it can only be called a human body equivocally. And the same goes for its parts. So the eye is only an eye equivocally after the separation of the soul from the body. Aquinas adds that it makes no difference whether the soul is replaced by another substantial form, as some people suppose, or not by no substantial form, which he says is more likely the truth. So Aquinas does not even think that Christ's body in the tomb was a body. He thinks it lacked a substantial form of its own and was a mere heap of matter of different kinds. It was a heap of different bodies of different kinds. Thus, Aquinas would seem to have no objection to God having a non-rational nature, since he thinks God, in fact, had such a nature, namely a corpse, for three days. So why can't Christ assume the bread on the altar and thereby make it his body? Of course, given the substantial difference between bread and a human body, Christ assuming the bread would not make it the numerically same body that suffered, was buried, rose from the dead, and so on. Or would it? By the time he addresses the last question about Christ's body in the tomb, Aquinas seems to have changed his mind somewhat. When asked, was the body of Christ nailed to the cross numerically the same as the one lying in the tomb, Aquinas replies that it was. 
A difference in kind usually makes for a difference in number, so that a living and a dead body are not usually one and the same. But Aquinas says, sameness in subject or hypostasis is greater than a difference in kind. And Christ's living and dead body had the same subject, Christ the Word, who remained united to both. Hence, he concludes that Christ's body in the tomb was numerically the same as the one nailed to the cross. Indeed, he goes so far as to say that everything with one and the same subject is numerically one and the same. That suggests that if Christ assumed the bread on the altar, it would then be numerically the same as his human body, in spite of their difference in kind. Now, I must admit that I cannot follow Aquinas' way of thinking here. I do not see how merely having the same subject could make bodies that differ in kind the same in number. I do not see how Christ assuming both bread and a human body could make them one in the same body. And I'm not even convinced that um, Aquinas himself thinks so, although he says the same in other places, like the Summa Theologiae, where this question is raised. But earlier, like in the sentences commentary, very interesting, sorry, I'm going off script now, but it's interesting. Um, he asks whether the word, Christ the word, could assume two human natures, two distinct human natures the nature of Jesus and the nature of Peter, for example. And Aquinas says that he could, and that if Christ assumed two human natures, he would be one person, but two men. Now that suggests that if Christ assumed bread on the altar and also a human body, the two would be one person, but not one body. They would be two bodies distinct in nature and in kind and in number. Anyway, that would be my view of the result of assuming the bread. Yet even granting that the bread and the body of Christ would be numerically the same by assumption, Aquinas still could not think that is how Christ's body comes to be present in the Eucharist, if for no other reason than because it would involve an ongoing gain and loss to Christ's body as new bread is consecrated, assumed by the word, and then consumed by the faithful. As I mentioned, Aquinas thinks that giving us his body as food involves no loss whatsoever to Christ's body. In fact, he thinks that Christ's glorified body can no longer suffer any gain or loss. He makes this clear in answer to a question from his later teaching period about whether Christ truly ate by incorporating food into his body after his resurrection. He's said to have eaten fish on the uh, banks of the Sea of Galilee, for example. And the question is, did he really eat it? Aquinas says in reply, that Christ's risen body has now transcended the state of generation and corruption, and hence it would not have been appropriate for food to be changed into Christ's body. Instead, by his power, Christ resolved the food he ate into its prior matter, Aquinas says. So even setting aside the problem of how assumed bread could possibly be Christ's body, its assumption and consumption would still involve an ongoing gain and loss to Christ's body, which seems inappropriate to its glorified state. Suppose instead that Christ assumed the bread on the altar not to make it into his body, but merely to unite it to his divinity in his own person. Would that be enough to make Christ's body present with the bread by a kind of natural concomitance? since his body is inseparably united to his divinity? I think Aquinas would say no. As I mentioned, Aquinas thinks that if bread had been consecrated during the three days Christ was dead, his soul would not have become present, but only his unensouled body, just as it lay in the tomb. 
the fact that Christ's divinity remained united to his separated soul would not have been enough to make Christ's soul present with his unensouled body, even though his body also remained united to his divinity. So the fact that the body unites to the divinity and the soul unites to the divinity is not enough to make both body and soul present together wherever the other is. So too, the fact that Christ united bread to his divinity would not be enough to make his body present with the bread, even though Christ's body also remains united to his divinity. Assuming the bread on the altar would only be enough to make Christ's divinity present, Aquinas seems to think, not his body, blood, or soul. So to conclude, taken all together, the range of questions about the body of Christ posed at his quote, libido disputations, I think helped to reveal why Aquinas only offers this theory of transubstantiation to explain how Christ's body can come to be really present in the Eucharist. Aquinas is convinced that as the first cause of all substances and accidents, God can change the substance of bread into the body of Christ while holding the accidents of bread in existence without a subject. Although Aquinas also thinks that God can make two bodies to be located in the same place, and in fact did so with the risen Christ's glorified body, he does not think that God can make the same body to be located in two places. Hence, God cannot make Christ's body come to be located with the bread on the altar, since it would no longer be in heaven and would have to be located at the same time on every altar and in every tabernacle in the world, which is impossible. While Christ could perhaps assume the bread, uniting it to his divinity, it is hard to see how that would make it into his body. Even if it did so, it would involve Christ's body in an ongoing process of loss and gain, which Aquinas considers unacceptable for its glorified state. Merely uniting the bread to his divinity without making it into his body would not be sufficient to make Christ's body present with the bread. So given Aquinas' theological and philosophical principles, and assuming that transubstantiation, change of substance, locomotion, change of place, and assumption are the only explanations worth considering, it would seem that nothing less than the complete transubstantiation of bread into Christ's body is even possible if that body is to become really present in the Eucharist. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Turner. Um, that was a wonderful summary of all the important point, points about um, Aquinas' conception of what we call the real presence and uh, why transubstantiation, uh, Aquinas would think, is the only possible way for Christ's body to really be present um, at the altar. Um, let me just uh, add a, a little terminological uh, clarification. So, of course, um, for Christ's body to be present in heaven and at several altars at the same time is not contradictory. But strictly speaking, located in heaven and located um, at different altars would be contradictory. Okay, Located meaning being circumscriptively in the place okay that would be impossible which is why he has to be present non-circumscriptively okay now just uh, after this little clarification i think was you had a question first yes I'm <laughs> <here>. <laughs> no uh-oh Okay, just one sec. <laughs> Turner, can you hear was? Can you hear him? Okay. No. Well, now, now? now I can. How about now? Very well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Well, um <clears throat> thank you. I, I feel like 
you covered so much in this and there's so much uh, to, to like, dig into. And I, I just want to ask a quick question about this, um, um, this possible sort of counterfactual, like um, uh, if, if uh, the uh, uh, communion had been carried out during the three days when Christ was in the tomb. So if I'm understanding correctly, it's that, okay, so it, suppose, you know, that someone had done, that th that had been done and it had all been done in the appropriate way and so forth, then there would be no soul in the host of Christ because of course it doesn't exist. Is that correct? It isn't that Christ's soul didn't exist. Um, it, it's that Christ's oh, soul oh, and body Oh, sorry. I think I, I need to turn the sound okay. off. Okay. No, you, you turn it off. You, you turn your mic off and turn it. I think now we should uh, yeah. turn the mic off. Over there. Okay. All right. So it isn't that Aquinas thinks that Christ's soul doesn't exist at that time, but during the three days that Christ was dead, his soul and body were separated because death is the separation of the soul from the body, Aquinas thinks. And so um, during that time, Christ's body lay in the tomb and Christ's soul descended to the dead. And Aquinas thinks that Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, remained hypostatically united to the body in the tomb and to the soul descending to the dead. But the soul and body themselves did not remain together united so as to constitute a human nature. And uh, because he thinks that the body comes to be present just as it is, if it's dead, then it comes to be present as dead, as a corpse. So if there had been a mass celebrated during the three days that Christ was dead, his body would have indeed become present, but only his dead body, his corpse. And so his soul would not have been present with his body, but only his unensouled body would have become present. Even though both soul and body remained united to the word, since they were not united to each other, he thinks that only the body, that is the uninsoled body, would have become present. That's what he says anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, now unmute your mic and I, I mute it. Okay. Speaker. All right. So then, okay, thank you. So that helps to clarify for me and that yeah. sets up the question I'm, I'm wondering about. So in the in the tertia part, 75, 6, Aquinas asks about the whether or not the substantial form of the bread remains. And there's this kind of discussion about, well, if the form, you know, uh, is imparted, Christ's form is imparted, well, doesn't it, I mean, since the form includes the soul and the, the animate part of the existence, its existence and its, you know, uh, 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 capability for rational thought, don't all these things get um, added on to the Eucharistic, the, the bread? So, and, um, and he says, no, well, really, the, they get is the form, but it merely com uh, communicates or it gives bodily existence, not animate existence. So the form can't move or perceive. And it seems to me that that's a bit at odds with this idea that the form in some way would otherwise not be present because, uh, you know, Christ would, was dead because it still has to be that it's communicating some part of this existence. So um, maybe this is just one of these tensions about why if the soul is the form of the body, the body looks the same for a short while after death i'm not sure but i'm is there a tension here or am i missing something basic i'll mute my mic so i'd have to look at the tertia pars passage again i i've i've read that before because it's in these questions about whether the bread is annihilated whether its form is annihilated and so on I, um but when you say that the full range of the um of Christ's uh, forms properties are not communicated. Do you mean communicated to the remaining appearances of the bread? Because he does yes. not think, yeah, so um, he does Wait. not, oh, sorry. If I understand him correctly, Aquinas does not think that Christ's body in the Eucharist lends any support to the existence of 
the remaining accidents of the bread. Those, those accidents don't become accidents of the body. They don't inhere in it. God, by a separate miracle, has to support them in existence. So there's no, um, I guess, I would say there's no, uh, like, ontological highway back and forth between the accidents of bread that remain and the substance of the body of Christ that comes to be present. Um, and I think that that's why he thinks that the body of Christ can be present there under accidents of bread that are as small as you like. Even the tiniest particle, he says, can contain the whole of Christ's body precisely because the body is, is, is not the subject of those uh, accidents of the bread and is only um, related to them indirectly, he says. So, but um, I'm not sure if I see the tension um, I see some tension in the idea that um, things other than Christ's body and blood come to be present by natural concomitance. As I was preparing the paper, I thought, well, isn't that contradictory? Um, if the body and blood come to be present by virtue of the sacrament's power, his soul also comes to be present by natural concomitance because it inheres in the body and blood as its form. And then his divinity comes to be present by natural concomitance because it's inseparably united to his humanity, that is to his body and soul. Well, then why can't similarly the uniting of bread to the divinity by assumption make Christ's body come to be present by natural concomitance since Christ's divinity is inseparably united to his humanity. Now there's the tension that I see and Calvin's nodding. So I think he sees it too. <laughs> but um, I think though that Aquinas's curious remark about Christ's uninsold body becoming present without his soul makes it clear that for whatever reason, Aquinas would not think that assuming the bread could make his body also present by natural concomitance because merely being united to the same supposit, the same hypostasis of the word is not sufficient, he thinks, to make everything united to the word present wherever anything united to it is present. He clearly thinks that that's not the case. And so I think it's clear that he would not allow assuming the bread to be a possible mode of making Christ's body present merely because the bread and the body were both united to the same supposit. In the same way that if the word assumed two distinct human natures, Peter and Jesus, Peter wouldn't be everywhere Jesus is and Jesus wouldn't be everywhere Peter is, although Christ the word would be. But if we were using the term Peter and Jesus to refer to the natures, then they wouldn't be present everywhere that the other is. Jula has his hand. Yes, thank you very much. So I, I really have, have a problem with um, Aquinas' uh, accepting as a possibility of uh, a Christ person assuming two bodies at the same time and uh, thereby constituting one person and two bodies. Two men, because, uh, yeah. Uh, two humans, two, uh, two men. Uh, uh, because he also has this um, semi-logical, semi-metaphysical principle um, that uh, substantiva uh, multiplicantur per supposita. Yeah. Right? But uh, there would be one suppositum there. And there's just two um uh individuated uh bodily natures or two individuated human natures but individuated by what by that one and the same person so how would uh, how could they be two even the individualized natures could not be two so, so even if you, uh, you could same... even if you would i'm sorry even if you were to count um, the uh, multiplicity of bodies by the number of individualized natures. There, there couldn't be two individualized natures there. 
because there is just one and the same suppositum that would individualize both. Right. Would okay. you say the same about Christ's body on the cross and in the tomb? Because there I have a very strong um, uh, wish to say that they are two distinct bodies by the difference of their nature, living and dead. That's a substantial difference. And yet, if they remain united to the same supposite, then by your logic and Aquinas's, I mean, that's his argument for their unity, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> that is precisely. <laughs> um, we but may I have, don't like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering whether you would be able to um, uh, respond to this difficulty on Aquinas's behalf, because right now it cannot. Yeah, well, I... I that is one of those rare cases, yeah. <laughs> I should say. <laughs> I think that this is likely a sign that Aquinas changed his mind over time. And that's one of the values that I see in the quote libido questions that we have Aquinas treating related questions early in his career during his first teaching period and later in his career during his second teaching period. And if you look at the questions about the body of Christ uh, alive and dead in the tomb, he addresses three of those. And you can see the shift, I think, in his thinking about it. So that by the time he addresses the third question in his later period, he's adopted the same position that he takes in the Summa Theologiae Tertia Pars when he asks whether the body in the tomb was the same as the one on the cross. And he says, yes, it's numerically the same by virtue of the same supposite. And I think by then he must have abandoned his thinking, which he expresses in the sentences commentary, that the single supposite could have two distinct individualized natures. That's my impression, that he simply changed yeah. his mind. Probably, uh, yes. Uh, that is what makes us uh, confused, because this is one of those rare occasions that he felt compelled to change his mind about some really important issue. I okay. think so, Thank although you. I do want to see if I can find him discussing that same question about the word assuming two human natures elsewhere, because I don't know of it being discussed anywhere but the sentences commentary. Please do try to uh, pursue this for the sake of the volume that is coming out of this conference. Okay? We are going to talk about that at the round table at the end of the conference. Now, I think Calvin had their hand up first and then Richard, all right? Um, uh, yeah, so, so now I see attention of a different kind. Uh, so I thought that a, a couple of people, including perhaps you, Jula, have suggested that um, Aquinas thinks that individuation of bodies is not by the suppositum, but by the designated dimensions. Uh, and uh, and now, so it, it, it so in, in the picture we were just painting, it might turn out that there are not two distinct human beings because because they may be individuated by the suppositum, but two bodies, yes, surely. So to be one 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 human God one God human with two bodies, uh, unless he's given that up too, and now is prepared to think that, um, that that's not the principle of individuation for bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it is perhaps in this case, it would not be uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, individuation for the bodies carried out in terms of this, uh, of their dimensive quantities, because they would have to be co-located um, anyway. So um, it is uh, the uh, principle of individuation for um, bodies in a natural uh, uh, scenario, excluding, excluding uh, to the exclusion of uh, supernatural influence is uh, by means of um, dimensive quantities. But here, and now we are talking about the uh, nature's individuation, which already uh, presupposes the individual, uh, the individual person that has that nature. So this is a, a different case, I'm afraid. But this, uh, this definitely will have to be sorted out in mm -hmm. more detail, Turner. Yeah, when so it comes I, to that. Sorry. I, I would recommend um, looking at the new uh, paper by Gaston Lenotre, which yes. won the Founders Award from the Society of Medieval and Renaissance Philosophy this year 
and has just been published in the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly. He addresses this issue of individuation and specifically the question of whether Aquinas changed his mind about individuation by determinate versus indeterminate uh, dimensions. And he relates it to two different um, kinds of questions about individuation, at a time versus over time. And um, he really sorts it all out. I find it dizzyingly confusing. Um, but for the purpose of my paper, I'm not sure how relevant it is because Aquinas has the um, amazing idea that um, even if bodies are usually made distinct by their supposita or by their dimensions, doesn't matter whatever the usual secondary causes are. He says that God as the first cause can keep them distinct even without any of those secondary causes doing their jobs. Now that's amazing. I mean, it means that merely by God's power, two things can uh, remain distinct even if they don't have the usual sources of their distinction. Even if they don't have mm. different dimensions, the two bodies can be kept distinct by God. Even if they don't have different supposita, the two bodies can be kept distinct by God, he says. They, now, would, have to have, uh, they would have to have two distinct acts of being, though. They would. That's how yeah, <laughs> God keeps two <laughs> bodies distinct in the same place. That's right. Uh, so, by giving them two distinct acts of being. And, and that's all yeah. it would take. <laughs> but um, it is uh, inapplicable in this case when there is one suppositum with one ester and no two distinct acts of being for the two bodies. Hmm. That, uh, and that is why it seems to be impossible because this seems to involve the contradiction. Yeah, quite. No, I, that is I my, that is my problem. The, yeah, no, I, I see that about his earlier position, yeah. It is a very curious remark he makes. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I don't want to uh, take away Richard's time. Would you come on, Richard? Uh, you know what? And just sit in my place because now this one is working properly. Okay. Okay. Well, it was just a couple of comments, really. Um, <clears throat> one was I know to Christ's late teaching on the question of whether it would be one human being or two human beings is that it would be one uh, if assuming that the, 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 the person assumed two human natures, you would have one man or one human being. And he has this nice example about, you know, if there was a chap who was wearing two sets of clothes, you wouldn't say there were two clothed people there. You just say there's one person with two sets of clothing on, right? And it's the same principle here. There's, there's one person with two natures on, right? And he says, you don't want to push the analogy too far because it had been condemned pretty badly in the previous century. Um, that's what I remember from the later stuff. It, I'm sure it crops up a few times. And the other was the assumption option. Um, I can't, um, it's normally called impanation. And uh, it's a view that you found on and off in the sort of 12th century. And then it's a matter of great controversy whether it was or was not condemned at the Fourth Lateran Council, depends how you interpret what they have to say about the transubstantiation stuff there. Um, and actually, someone we, who's mentioned earlier on, Gary Macy, has written quite a bit that's quite helpful about this. It's very clear and sort of. Anyway, that was it. It doesn't really call for a response unless you are so rude. Could you uh, repeat the name of the person you said had um, written such good stuff on the Fourth Lateran? Macy, Gary Macy, he's a history of okay. liturgy chap. Mm. Okay. That's Macy, why? Yeah. But uh, you don't remember where he gives the clothes analogy? Yes, probably. it's in the beginning of the summer. It's probably the stuff when he talks about uh, the, the assumption from the side of the person. It's question three or four of the third part. And it's going to be somewhere pottering down near the, the dreg end detritus bit, down, you know, article six or seven or something. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take a look at that because that, that, um, that would make it clear that he's changed his mind on this and would also make it um, clear, I think, that the change in the quadlibital questions represents a change in his mind. There are some ways to try to resolve that. I, I've been presenting it with its starkest contrast, but there are some ways, I think, to resolve those um, tensions that he's simply saying, well, it would be one supposit, but not necessarily one body. 
that wouldn't overcome Jula's logical objection, but it could be a way of massaging the text to make them all cohere together into a, what, what may be an incoherent position philosophically. But um, thank you, Professor Cross, for those suggestions. I appreciate them. Thank you. We are almost out of time. Well, in fact, we are a little bit over time. And uh, uh, I see that Milo showed up in the meantime. So thank you very much, Turner. This was terrific. You're welcome. Really. <laughs> thank you so much for having and me. We are uh, really looking forward to your chapter in which uh, you sort these things out in the end. Thank you. Oh, oh, <laughs> All right. Wonderful. I'll you. try. <laughs> <laughs> Can you stay on for the yes, rest I of will. the thank you. session? Oh, I'll just perfect. go and um, refill my coffee if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Okay.